let's talk about your business strategy and the juicy details of what actually works from mainstream fashion to fashion on Main Street and the entire ecosystem behind it. How do we scale your company and do it with the balance and the happiness that we all seek? Let's hear from those insiders, experts, and strategists that actually make it happen. I'm your host, Ashley Alderson from the Boutique Hub, and I can't wait to chat. Hey guys, welcome back. You are in for such a treat today. Uh, Jessica Anderson, also known as the Tiny Tello on, on TikTok, also 93 Play Street on Instagram. Jessica, you have a number of viral videos and have really hit home with people in just the behind the scenes process of the business you're building. And I want to talk about all of that. I'm so pumped that you're here today. Thanks for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. We have a lot of rabbit holes to go down if you're ready. So buckle up. I, I want to start here. I know that you first started um, your career in social media management, which probably lends itself really well to what you're doing now. But tell me about that very first career and kind of how you grew in social media management. I got very lucky to get into social media management back mm -hmm. in the day. It was like over eight years ago now. They had influencers, but there wasn't really people managing brands accounts. It was really hard to find a role like that. Mm -hmm. It just so happens that all of the skill sets I had at the time made the perfect social media manager. I'm very <laughs> creative. I love graphic design. I'm very strategically minded. Mm -hmm. So, and the funny thing is I had Instagram later than like all of my friends, but that ended up being my career. And yeah. so I did that corporate in LA um, for about seven, eight years and then Orange County. And I worked in health and fitness, food and beverage, fashion, beauty. So I have a lot of different points of view about social media. So mm -hmm. it really made me a well-rounded entrepreneur at like that bases it on social media. Right, right. And we'll talk about the kind of the jumping off point, what led you into entrepreneurship after that career. But I have to ask you this because I feel like so many times I hear from people saying, well, I have social media. So I could be a social media manager, but from my vantage point, and I know from yours, those are two very different things. So for a business owner who's listening and they're like, you know what, it's time that I outsource this. It's time that I bring in a social media manager to my team. What do you think are the most important skill sets to look for? Like you said, you do graphic design and these other things. What should we be looking for? Um, I would avoid anyone who pushes a stock photos. A lot of um, mm -hmm. people that are new to the business will say like, oh, they can easily like get a, a lot of money from a client and then just push out stock photos because it's easy to create content. So I would avoid anyone um, that says that. I would try to find people that know what the trends are. So ask them like their favorite influencers, their favorite accounts to follow mm -hmm. and kind of see like what's up and coming and what's kind of like already been done. Um, so I always ask that when I interview, when I interviewed my assistant, I even asked her, I was like, who are your favorite influencers to kind of see like, is yeah. she up to date? Um, Cause you always want someone who's up to date with trends and especially with an account or a platform like TikTok, you want someone who's been on TikTok. So half of my job when I did social media management, you have to understand the trends, what each platform calls for, what works. So if yeah. you're bringing in someone who isn't looking at TikTok every single day, at least, mm -hmm. they're probably not going to do a very good job of understanding trends. Yeah, absolutely. Do you think it's something that uh, a business owner should have like a trial period for? Like, I'm going to bring you in, we're going to run a test. I want you to do this for a week and then evaluate at that point. Absolutely. People would always give me different tests, like create three pieces of content, mm -hmm. something simple. You don't want to, um, like a lot of brands back in the day in LA would be like, create this, 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 and then they would go just steal your work and your ideas. <laughs> so you don't want to ask for too much. Yeah. And then my husband and I are both entrepreneurs. We always do a 90 day trial with any employee. So of course, like yeah. tying that in once they pass the test. Yeah, absolutely. I'm sure that you have some tricks up your sleeve when it comes to batch content creation too, from those days that carry through to today, because time's precious as an entrepreneur. How did you manage, plan, and create content in batches? Oh my gosh. Um, I was actually on the phone with TikTok yesterday talking about this. I'm kind of changing my strategy right now. Um, huh. I typically think of like the hook and I get a sticky note and I just write out ideas and I also plan my content around, like as a woman, I'm not always dolled up like this. Mm -hmm. So I plan filming around sunlight when my house is quiet, when the remodelers aren't at my house. <laughs> so I plan content like that. And then I edit at night or on the weekends because at night you don't need the sunlight. I prefer natural, like coming through a window instead of a yeah. ring light. So that's kind of how I plan my content. And then, you know, even with my personal content, if I'm taking photos for Instagram, I will have some days where I have my hair and makeup like this yeah. and I just do like something more simple. I just do athleisure. And then when I curl my hair and I get all dolled up, I will only shoot nicer, you know, 
dresses, slacks, things like that. So I kind of tailor it towards Mm -hmm. the look of the day also. Um, So that's just a couple of different tips. And then when I was talking to TikTok, um, I, I have a favorite creator right now. And she's huge on there. She has twins. I just love yeah. her so much. Who is she? Let's hear it. Um, her name, I, I don't know exactly how to pronounce it, but she has Scott and Violet. Her name's um, Maya, I believe is how okay. you say it. Um, she's incredible. I think she has like 7 million followers now. Well, my awesome. contact manages her also and works with her. And I guess she like puts all of her content in drafts on TikTok. So I'm trying to change. I, yeah. I was an uploader. I would edit outside the app and upload. Okay. And so... She does drafts all day. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to try what she's doing. Yeah. So back up for a second. So you, is there a stage when you have like so many viral videos, so many views at TikTok that you get like an account manager that they help you strategize how you're going to continue to grow on the platform? So they approached me probably five months ago. Um, I already had probably 380K on the platform. Mm -hmm. I know some people will get approached around 200, 250K. And then it's kind of an internal program. I had never heard of it personally until I got approached. And the funny thing is I missed the email. It was in my junk. And she contacted (laughs) me at the time and I felt so dumb. Um, We've all been there. Oh, yeah. So that's how you see a lot of creators get sent like presents from TikTok. Those are the people that are sending like they sent me a cake and all kinds of fun stuff and they can get you sponsorships, events. So it's pretty cool. I, I really enjoy it. Yeah. All right. I I have so many TikTok things I would love to go down the rabbit hole on. But before we do, I want to just back up for a second. So we've talked about the fact that you were in social media management. Well, there was a turning point and you launched this business. Tell me about that point where you switched to become an entrepreneur. And that'll lead us down the TikTok road in a little bit. Oh, definitely. So there was a couple of different things brewing in my brain. I decided I wanted to do swimwear in 2018. Um, But my husband wanted me to do, you know, something from China and slap my name on it. And I I refused. (laughs) And I knew we didn't have enough money to front at the time, um, you know, doing something custom. So I just kind of had the idea, but I wasn't, you know, I was a little hesitant. Like, is it the right time? I eventually got interviewed by a very powerful swimwear brand that's in every department store ever. Mm -hmm. And they gave me a tour of their facility. And when I met that designer... And the CEO and everything, I thought, oh, certainly I can do this myself. And so whenever I heard that, I was like, whenever I, I just saw the facility, I was like, I can do this. Like, mm-hmm. what what could stop me? And so yeah. that's when we started putting the puzzle pieces together. And um, I'd been contacting factories since 2018 before yeah. I figured out my plan. So let's talk about that journey. So you've been calling factories and let's just call it what it is. You've been scrappy, right? I was, you and I were talking about this before we started to record, but I feel like I get that question all the time of how do I start my own line or how do I find a manufacturer? And there's not a book on how to do that. There's not a textbook. It really comes down to finding factories, sampling, and starting to put the pieces together. Tell me a little bit more about that journey because that had to feel a little bit intimidating trying to put all those pieces together on your own. It definitely was intimidated. And I'm not going to lie, I almost moved forward with someone who was going to really hurt me and my brand and my company. Um, Mm. I found this factory in, or they kind of specialize in targeting new entrepreneurs who want to start their own fashion or swimwear line. And they're based in New York. Mm. And I was going to move forward with them, but on their website, it shows some of their clients. So I went ahead and messaged all of them. I had talked to the owner of this company, everything. I was so close to moving forward. And I messaged all of the owners of the swimmer brands and they were all um, about to go under. And they told me, yeah, none of them. I don't even, I don't think any of them have made it out. I I don't think they exist anymore. Oh my gosh. And they're young girls like me who wanted to start their own line. And they just got, you know, they took advantage of them and it's super unfortunate. (laughs) I probably should make a TikTok about calling them out, honestly, so they don't (laughs) hurt more people because that just offends me. Like, yeah. From an integrity standpoint. Absolutely. And so um, I almost moved forward with them. Yeah. And then I found that I found the right person at the time who was a tech designer in LA when I started being in the right circle. So if you're not even, you know, talking to people in fashion online or anything, of course, the opportunities aren't going to come because you're not putting yourself in into that space. Yeah. So I had never really watched an Instagram live before. And I watched one and it was someone who was hosting some informative fashion thing or lecture. And I had just commented, I was like, what do you think about swimwear? And this woman is a tech designer and she saw my comment and then she messaged me afterwards. I met her a week later and I hired her a week later. Oh week my gosh. That. That's so awesome. we met 
on Instagram. It, it was great. And yeah. she was good at the time to get this off the ground. Yeah. And she had factory contacts and she kind of shopped my line around and saw what worked at the time. And mm -hmm. so I didn't produce in LA. I ended up moving it to New York, which is a whole other can of worms, but they did help me like get off the ground. So that was yeah. great. It's all, it's not always what you know, it's who you know, right? It's finding those contacts that can introduce you to somebody. I'm assuming at the time, as you were first starting the line, I feel like every good line starts with solving a problem, right? What was the yeah. problem you were trying to solve? Oh, wow. There were so many problems. So I'm from the coast of Texas. I grew up in swimwear and I could not find anything high-waisted. And I didn't understand why I loved to wear high-rise leggings, but there were no swimwear on the market that even remotely came that high. Yeah. And I, I study, I really like shapes. So like when you study the body, what would flatter it just yeah. like naturally and no one was doing it. <laughs> and so I'm like, wait, why wouldn't you make it hit the smallest part of your waist? So it kind of cinches you in and yeah. then tops that are more comfortable. And I have eczema, so I can't really have, um, too many thin straps. Yeah. This is the only thin strap top I have right here. The Tyler in the background. Um, and it's my favorite, but I can't have a lot of thin straps either. It irritates my skin. So there was a lot of different puzzle pieces that went into it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm just over here, like a mom of three kids, just wondering what is going to tuck in my muffin top and make me look skinny at the end of the day. So please design something for me. All right. So you designed this thing in LA, your first pieces of the line in LA. Tell me about, you said there was a story about moving to New York. What was that? How did you oh, decide to move? Gosh. Okay. So LA factory was great, but also what happens, oh, I should definitely say this. Um, so many people get taken advantage of when you're new, mm -hmm. um, in the industry, when you have a smaller brand, cause the factories think they can run you over because more than likely a lot of these smaller brands aren't going to last throughout the year. Mm -hmm. So they don't take you seriously, unfortunately. And that kind of was happening. I was getting a little bit bullied and delays were happening. Um, the main client at this factory was Frankie's bikinis. And so all of my stuff got pushed back from all of their stuff yeah. and it just wasn't really making sense. And so I ended up having to hire someone. Thank God I teach social media management because this is how I found my new production manager. I put it on my Instagram story. I was like, this is a fashion emergency. Like, does anyone know someone? I have all of this stuff in LA, but I don't want to move forward with production with them. Yeah. And one of my students connected me to someone she knew from fashion school and she connected me to my production manager. That's awesome. So yeah, it was, it was a lot to try to ship everything. It's very mm -hmm. abnormal. You, you don't normally just right. Like we were about to sign the papers and, and do everything. Um, yeah. And I just pulled the whole thing and moved it to, to New York. You've talked a lot about how powerful intuition is as an entrepreneur. Do you feel like, I mean, even going back to those moments, like really it's been your intuition that's led you on a lot of that journey and trusting it? Yes. Uh, oh my gosh. It's, it's one of the most important things. It led me throughout the whole entire thing. And my best friend is a healer. She's an intuitive healer as well. Mm -hmm. So we run things by each other all the time. She knows everything before anyone else knows it. And so <laughs> Even the name, her intuition approved it because um, yeah. we kind of do like these intuition checks with each other. Yeah. And the people, the handful of people that knew about the swimwear brand before I launched the friends um, that are in my circle could feel mm -hmm. it. You could feel the energy brewing beneath the surface. Um, yeah. You know, if you're still enough, you can kind of feel energy. And so it, it was interesting because we were like, how big is this actually going to be? Because I've never had a feeling like that before. Yeah. So it was very powerful. <laughs> I know you guys are always asking about live selling and e-commerce solutions. So I wanted to invite you just to learn more about Comment Sold. With Comment Sold, you can host live video across all of your platforms, automate your processes, and get support from a dedicated team. Comment Sold retailers typically increase their sales by 200% within six months of getting started. So what are you waiting for? Join over 7,000 thriving retailers and get exclusive Boutique Hub member pricing when you start your free trial today at commentsold.com backslash the hub. Tell me about that process of launching it because you did a great job of following that intuition and feeling that energy and then just building excitement before it was there and people were ready for it when the product finally arrived, right? Tell me about that process and your launch strategy. So my launch strategy, I had written out all of the pieces of content I wanted. Um, I have the list in my office right now. I believe it was like 50 pieces of video, 80 pieces of photo content for 
Pinterest and Instagram. So I had quite a bit of content I had been prepping behind the scenes. Yeah. As far as launch, I actually ended up changing my launch plan on the fly. I wasn't going to ship mm -hmm. worldwide and I was going to launch, I believe, on the 5th of August 2021. Mm -hmm. And I ended up launching at like 8 p.m. the night before because I had posted a video and it went viral. <laughs> and then we also switched to worldwide on the spot. And I feel so bad because I can't really control worldwide yeah. shipping rates. But I mean, I'm just grateful I can at least provide worldwide. Yeah. And so we did that on the spot. My husband woke up at like 5 a.m. the next day and was like, I said it. Tell everyone you can order now worldwide. And I was like, oh, my God. OK. <laughs> like, yeah. We were freaking out. <laughs> How did you celebrate? We had like a, a, a launch little dinner with some friends and it was before like I had been telling people and so it was it was quaint and we actually just celebrated our six month anniversary. Awesome. Awesome. So part of this is this whole idea of going viral, right? Which is just an unknown animal to a lot of people. How does that happen? I'm curious, just your, was there a strategy behind it or every time you're creating content, is that in the back of your mind? How do you get there? Absolutely. I, Nowadays, the algorithms are a little more challenging on TikTok because, you know, as mm -hmm. it evolves, it will. But back whenever, you know, I was going viral more consistently, I definitely knew when videos would go viral. Um, almost, I think 80% of the time I knew they would go viral because my background is in, you know, viral content with mm -hmm. corporate brands. So that was convenient. But um, you can kind of feel it when you create it. And just visually, mm -hmm. you can see like the lighting's good, the timing's good. You don't, I don't ever know, like, is it going to hit 1 million views or 10 million views? But I do know if it's going to go over like 200,000 views. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's exciting. It's, it's all storytelling and creating an arc. And I studied acting um, when I lived in LA and even before that um, for many, many years. And so I yeah. understand like storytelling and how to create that arc in a storyline, even if the storyline is just you putting on lip liner in the bathroom in the morning. <laughs> yeah. If someone doesn't know what that means, can you explain creating that arc? What is that? So you're, you're building a storyline. So an example, yeah. my, my life, you know, you, you have a career and it kind of grows and then you, you make your first six figures and that's kind of a little bit of an arc and then you launch a brand and then it's building and then it goes viral and you make a million dollars or something. That's the arc of the story. So okay. it kind of builds up like a graph. Like I think about it like a, like a graph. <laughs> So every TikTok I make, I, I always consistently think about that graph because if you're starting with something high with your hook, like your intro, like this is how I made six figures as a social media manager, yeah. you don't want to just kind of continue the graph, like the chart down, if that makes sense, if you were to put yeah. the storyline in a chart. So you want to, so you start your intro and then you want to make sure you're building to like whatever the arc is, like you're yes. building up to it. Okay. Yes. Totally makes sense. So you have had a couple of videos that have had to do with the Kardashian family go viral. Tell me about that experience. It was kind of crazy. It was, I knew that the video would probably do well because I knew going into it, I was one of mm -hmm. the first people out there to review the swimwear. And whenever I got the swimwear in my hands, I was like, there's no way this is real. There's no way this is this see-through and double lined or, or not double lined. Yeah. And so it kind of blew my mind and I knew it would probably hit like a million views. But then out of nowhere, I was at my husband's office working and ironically, this girl that was not very kind to me in high school messages me and I hadn't talked to her in years. And she said, hey, I think you're on BuzzFeed. And I thought she was hacked. I, I thought she, you know, they, they send you random links on Facebook. Yeah, yeah. And no, I was on BuzzFeed and then I freaked out. And then the next thing I knew I was in Cosmo. I cried for that one. <laughs> and then <laughs> I was in like every major publication. I think I was in like 20 or 30 of them. And then my aunt who doesn't even know that I do social, she doesn't know anything really. She's yeah. watching Inside Edition at night. And she's like, you're on Inside Edition. And I was like, no way. What? <laughs> I was like, that's so random. So it was, it was insane. And the funny thing yeah. is a lot of people, you know, I'm a Texan. I'm big on integrity in my business mm -hmm. and everything that I do. My husband and I, it's, it's our number one priority always. And so yeah. I did, you know, kind of call that out in that video because um, that's important yeah. to me. And that seems to be like the most important headline um, a lot of people chose to to use. So all the headlines say like called out for integrity. And I'm like, Ooh, oops. I yeah. Did not well, it was, it. I mean, it was good. I mean, it was well done. So you I want to talk about the video, but then also how you handled it after you had a two part video that you posted about like, hey, if you're going to knock off my swimwear line, like this is what I would do. And you like open the book about yours kind of compared to theirs. Tell me about those videos. So the interesting thing about those videos, 
here's what happened. Typically I have a <laughs> game plan for my videos. I was about to go on a road trip to my hometown for my 10 year high school reunion. And I was like, I just need to film this real quick before we go. Cause I don't want to film it like in the car. Mm. I had no game plan. I'm just like naturally that sassy. Like if I'm in the right <laughs> mood, that's just who I am. And so there was no game yeah. plan at all. And I just posted it and I had no clue it would go viral. I think it's one of my most viral videos. I think one of the parts has like 12 million views or something. So oh my gosh. I didn't see that coming at all. I was like, okay, people like that. I'm sassy. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was so good. So it was basically saying, and again, you guys, if you're, you're listening, you've got to go follow Jessica on TikTok and watch these videos. But you're basically saying like, hey, if you're going to knock me off, this is what I would do. But then ironically, Sheen also knocked you off. Tell me about that experience. My sister actually saw it first and she sent it to me. And what I actually think happened is the factory in LA that may or may not have done some things. And I definitely saw other people's stuff mm -hmm. in there. I, I didn't copy, I, you know, I was too far along the process, nor would I ever copy anyone else's brand. But I'm mm -hmm. pretty sure that they might have snuck some stuff into China into the China market. Mm -hmm. And multiple times people at the factory did tell me, you know, your stuff looks so unique. I've never seen anything like it, which is a huge compliment, but also mm -hmm. did they sell my stuff to Shein? And so I have one today. If you're watching on video, <laughs> this is it. Um, so this is kind of similar to the Tyler top. For me, I think going with a neon color is as a designer, I, I think it's an easy route. The colors look so different on camera. They look mm -hmm. different. They do. Yeah. Um, and then they have a, the the cheaper liner on the inside, which I rec I don't know if y'all if y'all see the Kylie video, I talk about it, but it is yeah. a cheaper liner on the yeah. inside. And then they have the bottoms, which aren't high waisted enough. I don't think they understood the concept that I'm going for as far as going high enough to cinch in your waist. So then they they kind of are more mid rise, and they they don't fit properly. I am impressed yeah. though the the coverage on the bottom is not bad. So right. they kind of color. They copy the same color scheme. And the reason why I knew that they definitely saw my stuff is because this is the pink. Um, but if you look at the blue, this is my new blue. I have a different blue that I currently mm -hmm. looks like this. I think this is my normal blue. Um, yeah. But I couldn't get this when I launched or I couldn't I couldn't get this when I launched. So whenever they were developing it, they actually stole this blue as well. So I knew that they had to know because no one would have uh, known this blue colorway unless you saw it behind the scenes because I launched yeah. with this blue colorway. Yeah. So interesting. So, you know, the more I think about this, I feel like this lesson and this story could be translated into so many different types of businesses, right? Boutiques get copied all the time. Brands get copied all the time, right? There's just the knockoff is the name of the game in fashion. But how you handle it says everything about who you are, right? And the type of integrity you have. What is your advice for people who are listening who are being knocked off? How should they handle it? What is the best route forward? What does it say about you and about them? That is a loaded question. Um, <laughs> naturally, I am just sassy and I have a platform. So I'm not afraid to put myself out there and use my voice. And I don't appreciate when people knock me off. Obviously, I work really hard on this. So, it, you know, it's hard to say because I do have the platform and that is typically the route that I do. Um, if you approach someone like Shein, they're not going to do anything about it, really. Right. Um, I say get it out there online. I've seen a lot of other people go viral for calling out Shein for knocking them off. So mm -hmm. at least you have more troops, you know, supporting yeah. your, your back. If you're going to go after someone big, you want to have people behind you. Um, yeah. And so fortunately, if I do ever need to approach someone, um, I do have people behind me, just like there were these social media managers, there's some, some young girls. And, I, you know, I'm sure they're, they're very nice, but they, I got word that they used me in one of their, they were pitching clients and sending them PDFs of, of clients and I was in there, which is a huge insult to me because, you know, I've worked my whole career in this industry. And so like, I don't appreciate mm -hmm. them, you know, knocking my work off. And so yeah. I, I did call them out and people did back me up on that, which I think is important. Um, so that's, that's how I handle it. <laughs> <laughs> I totally get it. But I think what you're saying too, is there's strength in numbers. And especially when it comes to someone like Sheen, who's doing this to our industry over and over again, we have to stand up and stand together and use our voices against something like that. Um, talk to me, just someone who's listening and they're like, you know what? I maybe have, have dabbled in my business. I've started a boutique or I've tried to start a line, uh, but I'm unsure of what my next steps are. 
What is your advice for someone who's getting started in this industry uh, to help them grow to the level of success that you've found? I think focusing on content and studying content. Um, you know, I taught so social media management for a long time. And a lot of people will create content that, that they personally like. But if you study what's going viral, it's not the videos with the crazy filters and the sparkles. It's videos that are framed well, facing a window so you're nicely lit. The mm -hmm. colors can show. So don't overcomplicate it. And also, a lot of people think the secret is to buy a fancy camera. Mm -hmm. And I completely disagree because even if you have a fancy camera, if you don't understand these little pieces to how to produce good content, having a nice camera is going to make it more complicated. Um, so understanding storylines, hooks, viral content, studying viral content mm -hmm. um, would, would come as a first priority. I love that. Besides just watching viral content, are there any other resources that you follow that are helpful to learn some of those lessons? For a long time, the answer would normally be no. Um, I, I couldn't find someone, <clears throat> excuse me, for a long time, but there uh -huh. is this YouTuber I was watching last night. I can pull up his name. I wish I had it memorized. His name is, oh, I was watching it. It just pulled up. Robert Benjamin on YouTube. Okay. I love. I love watching his stuff. I think he's very valid. He used to work for Gary Vee. Um, mm. And I, I would vouch for his experience. He He's very experienced. And I, I never say that in the social media space because, you know, the value out there, you know, it's kind of misleading sometimes. Yeah, it's totally subjective. Um, any other tips that you would have for someone when they're creating content and just in authenticity? You know, social media so many times can be smoke and mirrors. And really, it's misleading to the idea of what it means to be an entrepreneur. It, it looks so glamorous to people. Um, any other words of wisdom for creating just that real authentic content about what entrepreneurship is really about? I think lifting the veil on what social media is trying to portray entrepreneurship is very important. And I think mm -hmm. it's still very, it's, it's very valid in content. Um, the only thing I have to say in regards to creating content like that is keep it to the meat and potatoes. I know it's so easy to go on and on about all these different things, but then you want to share the story, but you want to keep the viewers engaged at the same time. So it's actually getting out there and it's getting more views, not only for yourself, but just for educating people. Yeah. So as far as that kind of content and other kind of content um, in general, you want to keep it to the important parts and don't be so repetitive and this and this and recapping it, especially on a platform like TikTok. Love that. All right, Jessica, thank you so much for spending the time that you did with us today. I have one last question. I ask everyone this question because I believe that we're all entrepreneurs for a big purpose, right? We're not just here to sell swimwear. We're not just here to sell clothes in a boutique, right? We're all doing so much more than that. So I'm curious, 30 years down the road, you're sitting on the front porch, grandbabies, family surrounding you, whatever that may look like for you in your life. And you're looking back at the line you created, um, the influence that you had on TikTok, all the things that you accomplished in your life. What are the things that you want your family to remember the most? I just want to leave a mark. Gosh, I've never talked about this before. Um, my husband and I just want to leave a very, very huge mark. We were actually talking about our long-term goals. Um, politically, we, we want to make political change, uh, like like sex offenders. Like we, we want to be sure like the, you know, there's actual repercussions. So many people in our life have had incidents happen and there, there was no punishment. So, you know, swimmer is mm -hmm. great. I'm so happy people love my swimmer, but at the end of the day, having that real change. So all of this, yeah. all of what my husband's working on is going to fund things politically for us so that we cannot, not that we would be bought because we, we are based on integrity anyway, but you know, in politics nowadays, there, there's a lot of things behind the scenes that we're seeing, mm -hmm. um, that, that revolve around money. And if you have an excess of money, you can't be bought, you cannot be manipulated. And so mm -hmm. we want our voice to really make real change in this country which is yeah. crazy because we're talking about somewhere, but like it goes that far for us. Yeah, and we totally want to build, we want to build communities for um, veter or homeless veterans. And so just making real change on a completely different level is our end goal. Um, you know, 20, 30 years down the road, hopefully 10 years, even 10 years down the road. So yeah, that's kind of the big, big game plan. We, we don't talk about it online, but that is. I love that. I, I have never had anyone ever answer the question that way. And I just have to pause for a second because I totally admire it. And I just want to say this. Sometimes people will say money is the root of all evil, right? We've all, we've all heard that like negative money mindset, but I always go back to money is a mirror. Money is a reflection of your character and what you choose to do with it. 
right? It's like a brick. You can take the brick and you can choose to throw it through the window of a cathedral and demolish it, right? Or you can take the brick and choose to build a beautiful cathedral. So I love that you are basing success and financial success on making real change that impacts other people's lives. I think that's really admirable. So thank you for that. Thank you so much. And along the journey, you know, my husband and I have always said, you know, we knew we were going to be here even when we were only making six figures a year or even less than that. Mm -hmm. And we've always felt the universe would reward us because behind everything, our intentions are pure. Our integrity is there. And so we've always known that the universe would reward us long ago before we got to this point. I love that. I didn't ask you this question, but again, now I'm, now I'm going on a tangent. I do have one more question for you. Um, in setting that intention, you and I mentioned uh, that you're big into vision boards. I'm also big into vision boards. Is that something that you and your husband are doing together? Or talk to me about that process of setting the intention for what you hope to be rewarded for long-term. We do our vision boards every January. Um, and so I always have my goals kind of picked out both, you know, in my health, in my business. Mm-hmm. I typically pick a word of the year. I haven't picked the word this year. Last yeah. year's was abundance. So instead of doing, um, what, what is it that people do every year? The, um, at the beginning of a the year, they set something. An intention? They, they set um, a resolution. Instead uh, of a resolution, uh. I put the word. <laughs> and so I just kind of, of pick the intention for the year and it kind mm-hmm. of changes um, right now, my intention is to step into your power and your confidence. Yeah. Um, so typically I think about like affirmations, like everything I need is within me is one of the main ones that I've used in my life. Um, but right now I've kind of switched over to step into your power because I think I'm, I'm leveling up into a whole new chapter of my life yeah. as a leader. And so stepping into that is important to me. I love that. Beautiful advice. Jessica Anderson, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. It's been a real pleasure to get to talk to you. Thank you so much. I appreciate you having me on. Hey guys, thank you so much for listening to this episode. We hope that you loved it. Don't forget to hit subscribe and leave a rating and review down below for a chance to be one of our featured listeners each and every week. For more information on our spirit of community over competition and how to access complete show notes and bonus downloads from our guests, head on over to theboutiquehub.com and join the community. We'll see you next week.